You know, there are things that I've wanted to do and not been able to do, things I've tried that have not worked out. Um, now, thankfully, that seems to be finally changing for me, so I'm happy about that. But, you know, that was 20 years in the making, you know. Sure. And uh, a lot of people um, are at, you know, ask about that. And I, my philosophy on it at this point is that you you pursue what it is that inspires you, and there's a reason that it inspires you, and you may not even know what all, all the gifts are, of, you know, until you follow that path. But I think it's important to do two things. I think you need to separate the long-term vision and where you want to go ultimately and look at the short term. You make the short term sustainable. You don't put all your efforts into a long term and totally do nothing to sustain yourself short term. I know people that have done that, they get themselves into huge problems. Um, on the other hand, if you do the other, you decide to you know, go to college and learn how to become an accountant even though you have no interest in it whatsoever and you do it to quote unquote fall back on, well, the problem is that's not something to fall back on, that's a career and it's going to take all your time. And you can't, uh, you know, one of the magic formulas for making sure you don't fall back is you don't have something to fall back on, then you won't. <laughs> so, so you move forward, you know. And so, but if you move forward, you do it on a sustainable way. If you do it, you do it in an intelligent way, where you can sustain yourself, short term, split your time, and at the same time, don't let go of the dream of what you really want, even if it looks difficult, or if it looks like it's something that. Um, you know, very few people succeed with, you know. I mean, are you playing the odds or are you following your dream? Right. You well, know, I, that's the bottom line. Right. And it, what's funny is when you follow your dream and you do so intelligently, things, sometimes you don't even know how the how is going to work, but the how comes eventually into play at the right time when the things are right. And I've looked back, I see things that didn't work, and now I see, you know, the time really wasn't right. You know, maybe it's good that it happened that way, you know. I think it all works for a reason, though. Yeah, and I w the other thing I would just uh, add to that is I think it's definitely, you know, your career is a testament to your tenacity because I'm, I can't imagine the pressure uh, in the household for you to put the guitar down and get back on that bike must have been enormous. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, well, there's mixed messages, you know, um, but it was very much driven by my own interest. Nobody had to tell me to practice, you know. Um, I remember at the music store, a guy, a friend of mine there, um, who, who was pretty inspired by, by, you know, my stuff, and I had shown him some things and given him some lessons, and he sat there one day and he said, you know, I'm sitting here playing this Bach piece or something, and and he's like, you know, that's really cool. He goes, I wish I had your, you know, your persistence. Your, you know, uh, what was the word he used? No, discipline was the word he used. I wish I had your discipline. And I thought about it, and I said, well, you know what? Discipline's got very little to do with it. I'm sure I have discipline, you know, from the training and everything, but I wasn't the most disciplined person. I wasn't the most disciplined rider, bike rider, and I don't think I was the most disciplined uh, player. I mean, I did practice and I did have an analytical ability so I could break it down and do it in ways that made sense to improve but it wasn't discipline it was inspiration I was doing it because I wanted to I wasn't doing it because of some outside reason you know somebody you know I thought I should or something you know gotcha well you're bringing us up into the early 80s uh, when you start uh, teaching at the music store uh, you want to tell us a little bit of how that was for you doing a private practice, you know, uh, private lessons, that sort of thing? Well, sure. I, I uh, taught all kinds of people. Uh, and, uh, I, I don't know. I just found that uh, for some reason I had the ability to teach, you know, because I, I think I, I think it comes down to the ability to analyze and break things down and then the ability to articulate them, communicate it to someone else, and caring about people. And uh, I had all the three of those elements. So I think I made a pretty good teacher, and, and um, so it uh, it's hard work though. And I, I, teaching is is difficult, you know. At least when you try to do a good job, I think it it can be very difficult. 
um, I always found that by the time you get like 40 students, you're doing half hour lessons. That's pretty. Um, it's a pretty full schedule, actually. You know, to to be up oh, yeah. on that. Um, it's more full. It takes more energy than most other jobs that you'd sit down for 20 hours to do. You know, it seems like it's a part-time deal. But anyway, uh, what I wound up doing and more and more is, you know, of course I was into rock, and, and so more and more I started to attract people that wanted to play rock. And um, they'd come in and they'd, you know, show me, you know, this song, like, you know, play this song and that song. And that really mm -hmm. developed my ear because, you know, I wouldn't, you know, uh, maybe some of them I might once in a while take something home because I wanted to learn it myself, you know, I'd take it further. But uh, I was learning stuff by ear, you know, like Randy Rhodes and the Van Halen stuff and off the records, you know, I just listen to it over and over and over and over, you know. You take the needle on the old vinyl, you know, yeah. you take the needle, you raise it. And I had a, I had a uh, uh, turntable that when you raise the thing, it would actually, it would go up, but it would also go back like a couple of grooves. So every time I I raised it, I could drop it, and I'd hear the same phrase. <laughs> nice. You know? nice. So it works pretty good, and, and, um, but it was developing my ear. And then when I'm in le lessons, people come in, and I got good enough with it that when I was you know, like 18, 19, whatever, I was learning the stuff on the spot as I heard it and showing people you know, phrase by phrase what it is. Nice. And, uh, and that was really, um, that was a good start. You know, and then uh, one day along comes uh, an editor. Well, it was Will Schmidt who wrote the uh, basic Hal Leonard guitar methods, and he was the editor, um, acting as an editor for Hal Leonard. And of course, they're going around to uh, to talk to teachers at music stores because that's where the bulk of educational material sold. You know, once teachers start using a product and really understand it and 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 like it. You know, then you're assured that a product is going to keep selling long term. And uh, so they, they sent him out, you know, to uh, talk to us teachers. And uh, he sat down and he showed us the stuff. And I said, hey, you know, that's all well and good. But, you know, my students, 90% of them want to learn how to rock. You know, they don't want to play Buffalo Gals and stuff like that. <laughs> Kumbaya. You know? yeah. exactly. <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, you write, um, why don't you write it? Wow. And uh, I said, okay. And so I did. You know, I wrote a book. And, uh, you know, he said, in fact, what he said was, write me a sample chapter and, and uh, give me an outline. And I couldn't do that. I started to write a sample chapter. And until I understood the whole, I don't know, I seem to have this, this inability to uh, do just a, to, to do something to a degree without really feeling like, like I master it, you know, and so I ended up feeling like I had to write the entire book so that I could pare it back down and understand what needed to be in the first chapter, and so I did, and uh, it turned out that they couldn't publish it because uh, I was using other people's music, and they didn't even know it at the time. They thought they could, so then he came back to me and said, no, it didn't work. Um, sorry, we can't do this, so then I thought, well, I guess I have to write my own music for this method, and I thought, at first I thought, man, that's too hard. There's no way I could do that. And uh, then I thought, you know, maybe I can. So I gave it a shot, and I did it. And then I thought, well, I could do that for rhythm guitar, but I could never do it for lead guitar, you know. But then every time you do something, you get, you're at a new point then, and then you feel like you can tackle new things, you know. So then I did the, you know, what, what I ended up writing, like with the Speed Mechanics book, would have been inconceivable for me to write four years before 